Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching from Israel by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. This week we look at the Northern Kingdom of Israel in a time of growth, but then later in a time of calamity, next on Kings and Kingdoms. Thank you for joining us today. I'm David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I am Jeffrey Seif. People turn on television, they want to see good news, I get that, but sometimes we look and it's not so good. Case in point, some of these ancient leaders in Israel have a lot to be desired, yes? Leaders, I, this whole series is about leadership. Can you define that? Well, in so many ways, you know, I look at leadership, there's a difference between a politician and a pastor. But at the end of the day, leaders should use their influence to help move the organization forward in a way that fulfills its objectives. And uh, we just don't see that happening very well, sadly, at this moment in time in Israel. And in this part of the series, the, the kingdoms are divided. Yes. We have the ten tribes in the north, two in the south, yes. and we're talking more about the north today. Yes, the ancient kingdom, I should say. Uh, just to reiterate it, I'm not critiquing so much the modern moment in, in Israeli politics, but in antiquity, it's really deteriorating on the quick. A lot of evil in the sight of God? Yes, in fact, in it says as much explicitly in the Book of Kings, and interestingly, evil is the word live spelled backwards. Ah. It's all upside down in so many ways. It is. It, it's sad to see. Yes. But that was, it was a lot, I think, that the kings were supposed to be God's voice yes. and also rule the people. Is, that's a lot for a single person. Yes? Yes, to be sure, but people can have character. The lack thereof leads in a bad way, and we see it at play in the literature. We'll hear all about that today. That's we right. Will. Actually, right now, let's go to Israel with Dr. Seif's teaching. It's not that the biblical author gave him a pass, but he definitely passed through note of his indiscretions, which were egregious, in order to give him credit. What am I talking about? I don't want to play my hand just yet, but I want to say that the story had to do with where we are right now. Adjacent to me is Jericho. We're right there at the lowest part of the earth. Jordan is not far away. Saudi Arabia is south. Uh, you go uh, up the Judean foothills, which are adjacent to me. You get to Jerusalem. This is borderland, and it was a significant border. When Israel broke away from Judah, they established this as a border outpost. It was significant. You had to control this in order to control the gateway to Jerusalem. It was very important. You needed to control this in order to stave off assault from others that are coming to you down through the Judean wilderness or across the Jordan. This was an important place. Now, the reason why I'm developing this borderland is because, as we'll see when I open up the Bible, the author in Kings is fully aware of the fact that the king in view today, Jeroboam, was a sinner. He was bad to the bone, just like the man he was named after. And he says as much that this Jeroboam II, who's the object of our attention here, was, uh, he followed in the footsteps of Jeroboam I, who was the worst of the worst in Israelite history. But 
he credits him with something instead of defaming him. And what does he credit him for? Oh, listen to me, this is so interesting. It is so appropriate. It so speaks to the moment. He credits him with securing the border of Israel, something that he had judged to be very important. I wanna look at the book. I wanna apply it to the moment here as we continue on in our story, looking at kings and kingdoms. Come on with me to the Bible. For me, it really was something of an aha moment. Not the first part of it in uh, uh, 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 24, he says, Vayas harabi ene Adonai. And he did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. I mean, I say that, expression so much in the series. You might think it's the only thing I know how to say in Hebrew. It's just that it's attached to so many people that they did evil. And then there's some development to the evil, but subsequent to this, it's not developed. You go on, never mind verse 24, where I just read. If you look in verse 25, he gets a credit, which is then explored and amplified. Uh, I'll read it in mine. Who has Shiv et Gavul Yisrael? He restored the border of Israel. And he goes on then from the entrance down to the Arba'ah, which is where we are right now. The Arba'ah, the dry lands. As I said at the outset here, we're right at the border. And uh, this is a king who's noted for establishing and for securing a border right here. And relative to borders, when you go on before we get um, to when he gives up the ghost, uh, when the author speaks more about him, he notes cities that were established to expand the borders. It's interesting, this is one who's noted for his accomplishments, his perfidy, his religious faithlessness is noted, but he's credited with securing Israel. Now, what do I wanna do with this? I think it so much speaks to a moment and I say that because I know that uh, in, in my culture, there's all kinds of concerns about border, and I get that. Uh, what I find here is those who attend to the border and secure it are noteworthy. Again, it's not that he's given a pass for all else that was wrong with him, but he's credited with it. And against that backdrop, uh, if I speak of biblical faith and virtue, for a leader to establish the boundaries, for a king to establish the boundaries of his kingdom offends no biblical religion. That's what is to be expected. Now that said, I think in my culture, America, and I know this goes you know, beyond the continental United States to different parts of the world. I know that because someone reminded me of that when they came up to me from Australia this morning when I uh, went down to breakfast at the hotel. I know it gets around, but I know in my culture, you know, America has thousands of miles of border with ocean, with the Atlantic and Pacific. We're not worried about getting attacked by whales. Canada hasn't been a problem. And really, until recently, Central and South America hasn't been an issue. Now an invasion is less to do about wars as it is to do with desperate people. And that raises the issue in my generation and in this particular moment about what to do about borders. Is it okay to secure them? Listen, I don't find it the least bit beyond the pale of reason to secure borders. On the way to this location, we passed some villas and I couldn't help but note they had walls around them to make sure that the only people that got in were those who were invited in. We do that, we lock our cars at night to make sure that no one gets in who doesn't own it. We lock our homes to ensure that no one gets in there that doesn't belong there. For us to do that with the national home doesn't bother me. I advocate personally for just and equitable policies. We wanna find ways to help the disenfranchised. There's a way to do it legally. There's a way to do it that's secure. To me, it makes no sense. I know these people that talk about sanctuary cities. We defy law to let everyone in any Anyone go there with the promise that we won't touch them for being there. That to me might sound like virtue, but to me it's absolute insanity. For my money, and you can feel free to disagree, maybe I'll get some mail, what of it? Can't please everyone, but for my money, when I look at kings, when I look at kingdoms, when I look at the nation state here, to me I found it interesting that one man who used his efforts to secure the borders is noted in a positive way for so doing. I say, let's find leaders in our culture that will do just that.
When the Parthians invaded the north, they killed his brother Phasel. Herod, for his part, ran and deposited his family not far from here at a place called Masada, and then ran off to Egypt to secure some help. When he didn't get it, he went to Rome, where he was affirmed as the king of Judea. And he was something to be reckoned with at some point in time. This is one of a number of his palaces. But you know what? Just like his name and his kingdom, his famous palace came to ruin. And so it is, I'm reminded of Yeshua, of Jesus, who once said to seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and then everything else will be added unto you. What most people do by way of contradistinction is they seek first their own kingdom and they disregard righteousness and only discover that the things they gather to themselves wind up getting away from them. We're going to look at a story in the Bible in this segment where there was one king in particular who came. He was one of a number of kings and uh, he was the last of a dynasty. The whole world fell apart. And we're going to look at that story and see what we can learn from it. Come on with me. We're going to take a look at the book. Those who rely on the dint of their own determination wind up standing alone in life. And why is that? Because they're principally all about themselves. And so they stand alone as opposed to being interconnected with others. And so it is with the pursuit and acquisition of power. In order to get it, you conspire and betray. Once you get it, you can't trust those in proximity to you because you know they're just like you. I mention that because we're at the ragged edge of biblical history now for the kingdom of Israel. In fact, the last of the kings, his name was Hosea. And in chapter 15, we're told Hosea made a conspiracy against Pekah, the son of Remaliah. And he smote him and he slew him. And isn't that so much how the game is played in the world called politics? People knock the legs out from underneath others and advance their own cause. We'll see here it leads to no good end because once you live by the sword, you die by the sword. When you look in chapter 17 of the same book, that is 2 Kings, we're told the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away unto Assyria. And with that one sentence, the nation state of Israel flies into an incinerator, never to recover again. In proximity to that statement is a laundry list of the northern kingdom's sins. It wasn't just that Hosea wasn't cut from the right cloth and was stealthy and acquired the kingdom unacceptably. He came in a long line of those who did just that. Their kingdoms do not stand. There were nine dynasties that had risen and fallen in the northern kingdom of Israel. Finally then, the whole kingdom falls. Assyria overruns them, takes them off into captivity, and that's the end of that. So much for biblical history. What can we learn from that? Oh, you know, when it comes to power, they're called debates. And a lot of that is just knocking the legs out from underneath the other to show yourself to be better than the other. Personally, I would suggest that we look at deeds, not at creeds. There's a verse in Proverbs that says that a child makes himself known by his acts. I'm interested in what a person does before they come to the presidential debates, uh, the, you know, the mayoral debates, the city council debates, or whatever it is they're talking about. Who is that person? And if I learn anything from my assessment of kings and kingdoms, advanced herein is the idea that those who live righteously enjoy success in life. Conversely, those who are nefarious, that is evil, and the word evil is the word lived spelled backwards. They pretend to be advocating for life, l'chaim, but at the end of the day, it leads to death. Those who live with the wrong ideas end in ruin. And I'm telling you that from this place, a ruin of a once great monarch here in the land of Israel.
Our Creator chose certain places on the planet to reveal Himself and His message of redemption to us. Mount Sinai, Moriah, Olives, the Mount of Beatitudes, as well as various seas, rivers, and deserts, these were the places. Some are now only ruins, yet they continue to tell of the Lord's faithfulness and love. These sacred backdrops have been beautifully captured in our resource. This week, the book, Heaven and Earth, Landmarks of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Our producer and director, Ken Berg, has assembled some of his favorite photographs taken during his four decades of travel through the lands of the Bible. Contact us and ask for the book, Heaven and Earth. If you're thinking about visiting the Holy Land, come on a Zola tour, where the scriptures come to life as you get teaching from a messianic perspective. Our spring tour goes to Israel and Petra. In the fall, you can add a cruise of Greece and Ephesus. Come to Israel. See the Jewish roots of your faith. Call us at 1-800-WONDERS or click on the levitt.com slash tour info. Shalom, chaverim. Welcome to our series on exploring the words in Hebrew for worship and praise. I am so excited as a worship leader to explore this with you because I know that when you adopt these words into your lifestyle of worship, it will truly transform your life. Now, in English, we primarily use the words praise and worship. But in Hebrew, whenever we see this word praise, there's actually so many other words with so much more meaning. Now look at this word today. Our word is tehilot. It comes from that root word halel that we already looked at. But tehilot has a beautiful meaning. It means to sing a song, a new song, a spontaneous song to the Lord. Have you ever tried singing a song to God? Maybe just in the car or in the house by yourself. Maybe it's words that you've never heard before, but they're the words of your heart. I want to tell you that when you just sing a melody to the Lord, when you sing your own words to the King of Kings, it blesses His heart. There's this incredible verse in Psalms. It says, God dwells in the praises of Israel. In Hebrew, it says, Yoshev, Tehilot Israel, which means he actually inhabits. In English, we translated it enthroned in your praises. But I love this word dwells because it means that we can be in the presence of God, in the true presence of God when we worship him. So as you go about your week this week, I want to encourage you, take some time, maybe when you're all by yourself, to praise God. Maybe sing a new song to Him. Whatever comes to your heart, sing it unto Him. I promise you, the presence of God is going to come and fill you in that moment because the Bible promises us that God dwells in the praises of His people. Right. 
I love listening to Dave and Kirsten sing about Yeshua, the Jewish way to say Jesus. I look at worship music as prayer uh, put to music. It ascends upward. We're looking at a place now, tragically, in biblical literature where things are descending downward. We'll get to Yeshua. We'll get to Jesus, get an upswing. But now we're looking at a downturn. Uh, Dr. Baruch Kavashnikov, well, about to be doctor, he is a professor and the leader of the Jerusalem Seminary, gives us some perspective on Israel's demise in antiquity. Let's go to that now. Baruch, in so many ways, the northern kingdom was rotten at the core. Eventually, it fell apart, did it not? It's very true. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter 17, it, it shows that Hosea, the king of Israel, lost his mantle because he was following the customs of other countries. He just was not faithful and he was allowing injustice to reign. And because of that, God brought Samaria down. You know, and it's my concern that we have leaders in culture that are following the gods of other cultures, not Judeo-Christian values and ethics. It can have the same consequence, you think? It's true. We, had, we have evidence in Samaria of people really taking on the culture of others and priding themselves in what they had, what they contained, what they could showcase. They were putting up ivory tusks in their lounge chairs, in their furniture, and this was evil in the sight of the Lord. They were spending it on themselves rather than on the poor and the destitute. Yeah, the prophets spoke about these affluent sorts on their ivory couches. Uh, there's actual uh, a testimony to that effect archaeologically. Have we found, have we unearthed some of that? That's right. Just before Tiglat Pleasure III's conquest in 735 and so, there's a discovery that's been made, the house of ivories with hundreds of pieces of ivory discovered right there. Beautiful carvings that show Phoenician influence, the customs of the, of the pagans. You know, it reminds me too, America is a very affluent culture. The Northern Kingdom was more fluent than the Southern Kingdom, certainly the pasture lands, and, but what, it got out of hand. People get into their affluence, they forget the God who gives it to them. Again, yes, they followed these other nations, pagan authorities. They allowed it to come into their hearts, be realized in their stuff, and that was their downfall. Well, thank you for sharing, insightful. Thank you. This whole series is like we're at a Bible college desk with you, and we have Professor Baruch that shared with us today, but we have the best professor, professor at Seif. this desk. <laughs> well, flattery yes. will get you everywhere. <laughs> we're trying. <I'm> <laughs> we're learning so much. What, what have I we got here today? I appreciate that you like me. I can assure you these guys don't. Uh, these guys, I'm just not really super duper impressed. You know, Saul, not much there. David, I loved him at the first, you know, mm -hmm. but goodness, I just can't get past Bathsheba and murder to cover it up. And God forgave him, I know his sons didn't, but his kingdom didn't end uh, well. I give him a D. Others might grade him a little higher, but again, I just can't Man after him. God's own heart. Wow. He was, and uh, I don't expect perfection till we get down here. Right. Um, uh, when we're looking at Jesus, Yeshua, and I see some others that are noteworthy as well, but I'm a little harder on the guy maybe than most would be. <laughs> uh, with Solomon, his son, starts off good, but way too many women. I'm just not going to walk past that. And then after that is just a slew of Fs. Uh, but by the time we get to the kings for today in the northern kingdom, Jeroboam II, um, just an F. I mean, he was evil. The Bible says as much explicitly. Hosea, I mean, he's the, the last one. Uh, he comes to power through murder. Well, never mind a vote. Today we have the opportunity to vote. I mean, he stealthily seizes through intrigue and murder. 
and this is happening in, in God's kingdom. Well, it just should not be. Here's a be. question. Is it Daniel 2, is it Daniel 2.20 where it says, where, and I don't want to take it out of context, that God appoints the kings? Is, is that not correct? Yes, interestingly. So we have all these F kings? I mean, did God appoint these evil kings? That's confusing to me. Well, first of all, in, in Daniel, it's a prophecy about pagan kings okay. that, uh, that are going to be coming and going. Uh, to accomplish his purposes. And they're going to judge Judah and Israel. Here okay. we're looking at the kings of Israel and Judah. And um, they don't come by divine appointment. The only divine appointment is through the line of David, arguably. In he the, was the, the one to, to the southern kingdom. Right. And it was anointed and appointed because the ultimate king's going to come through that line. If you look at the first words in the New Testament in Matthew, Sefer Toldot HaYeshu HaMashiach Ben David Ben Avraham, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David. There, there's an anointed and appointed. This is a whole lot of wickedness here that has nothing to do with God's divine and design. And this one is the perfect picture of what everyone else should have been, obviously, well, what been. we and, all you know, should have been. You know, nobody's be. perfect, but we can get a whole lot better, I think. And, uh, you know, there's core values that are lacking. I mean, there's decency that's lacking lacking. Uh, there's incongruity. You know, kings, when they're coronated, they say things and offer up prayers, but they don't live it out. That's tragic. A little bit of pride there, maybe? A little lot, lot, a lot of bit of, of pride, pride, yeah. But I'm looking for leadership that has a little more core virtues. There it is, right there. There's virtues, leadership. How do we, how do we, how do we stay away from this in America? How do we keep it pure? We follow him, keep our heart pure and be virtuous, yes. right? More next week. We all get a vote. More next week to come as we look at the kings of Israel and Judah. Until then, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store. There, you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to Our Jewish Roots help us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministry.